All right, so I recently had a chance to go back to Libya for the first time in a very, very long time. Libya, of course, being where my family is originally from. It was a dope trip. Uh, since I graduated college, it was the first time I actually got a chance to like take a legit vacation that wasn't just a weekend trip. And honestly, it, it was much needed. I spent most of my time, both weekdays and weekends, at this very desk, sitting in this very chair, <laughs> uh, either doing my day job or uh, working on YouTube stuff. So it was nice to kind of disconnect for a couple of weeks and just not think about anything. The whole trip probably warrants a video on its own, not on this channel because the subject matter is about sports, but yeah, some some wild stuff happened. Like yo, I, I very much should not be alive right now. But as a whole, given it was my first time going back in so long, and given it was a relatively short trip, I, I spent most of my time doing one of three things. Eating, praying for the electricity to turn back on, and being stuck in traffic. I did other stuff, don't, don't get me wrong, but like those are the three that stood out the most. Eating, praying for electricity, and sitting in traffic. And at one point, all three of these events actually happened at the same time. One night I was in the car with my two cousins who were taking me to a cafe to grab a bite to eat and to watch a soccer game while we waited for the electricity to turn back on at the house. And of course literally everyone else in our side of the city had the exact same idea so we were stuck in traffic. Stomachs rumbling just chopping it up. And at some point, the topic shifted to the difference between crowds at a game in the US versus the crowd in Libya. They would tell me how crazy the fans were in Libya. And I was like, yo, man, oh, yo, don't sleep on the US. Yo, we got, <laughs> we got, we got some pretty wild, wild fans out there too. We got some, some crazy people out there in the state. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of crazy individuals. <laughs> One of them asked me to elaborate. So I told them about how one time back home in Seattle, there was a football game going on and a player scored such an amazing touchdown and the crowd went so wild that there was a legitimate earthquake in the area around the stadium from all the people jumping and yelling. They didn't believe me, so I showed them the video <laughs> and they both started laughing. At first, I thought they were laughing out of disbelief. Like, whoa, that's crazy. Earthquake, people jumping crazy, wow. But then I realized they were laughing at two completely different things. The first thing they were laughing at was my definition of crazy. <laughs> Cause right after I showed them that video, one of them whipped out their phone and was like, let me show you crazy. And played me a video like 120p of the crowd at one of the basketball games in Libya. <laughs> I was in the back of the car, I was like, y'all went. <laughs> I will hold this L, thank you. The chance kinda catchy too, huh? La 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 That's fire, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta bring that over here. We need to, we need to adopt their culture. It'll be fire. But here's the wildest part to me. The other thing they were laughing at when I showed them the video of the Marshawn Lynch beast mode touchdown wasn't just how trash the fans were, in their eyes at least, but also they were laughing at the fact that they had no idea what was going on in the video. In a sense, they just didn't really understand football as a sport. They had some familiarity with it, but they didn't really understand like, yo, why are all these dudes jumping on one another? <laughs> Which. <laughs> I, I know, I know I shouldn't be surprised. Like, yeah, maybe the world doesn't care about everything American the way we think. But we're talking about a sport with some of the highest valued franchises in the world, including one that is quite literally the most valued franchise in the world, in the Dallas Cowboys, who have one of the world's most valuable athletes on the roster, who plays for the most valuable league in the world. It's a sport with some of the highest TV ratings globally, with the Super Bowl only coming in second to soccer's Champions League finals as the most viewed event each year. So I wouldn't expect my cousins to know who's on the field or the team names or even what's going on. But to look at it and say like, why are all these dudes trying to jump on him? They catch me off guard a little bit. And as it turns out, the NFL is acutely aware of this problem. Not just my two cousins not knowing about football, but them sort of being a proxy or an analogy for the general lack of global awareness of the sport. The reasoning behind football's lack of adoption overseas can be attributed to any number of reasons, but it's probably some combination of how relatively young the organized sport is compared to others at the very least, the complexity of the sport, and how difficult it is to just pick it up and have a sense of what's going on compared to sports like soccer or basketball, which then makes it especially difficult to be adopted across regions when it's not already ingrained in the culture. Like for me, football was just part of culture living in America, kind of like learning English. I don't really have any knowledge around when I exactly learned football. I just kind of grew up 
up with it around me enough that it was always something that was somewhat familiar. And speaking of regions, because only the major leagues of the sport, the NFL, the NCAA, and CFL, are all based in America, it makes it extremely difficult for people living in other countries across either ocean to pay it any mind. Not because they don't want to, but because the games are going on on ungodly hours. <laughs> There's probably a few other reasons in there, but I think we hit most of the major ones. So what I'm trying to explore in this video is how the NFL is looking to address this issue of making football a more global sport, given the circumstances and barriers just mentioned. We'll also give some thought to other potential areas they can focus on to achieve the growth that they're aiming for. What's good, y'all? My name is Malik, and this is The Business of Sport, a channel dedicated to none other than, yes, the business of sport. If you're new here, I just want to give you a huge, huge thank you for taking the time to click on this video. For real, it, it really means a lot. I put a lot of time, effort, and research into these. So the fact that you cared enough to even click on it, that means the world to me. And if you're interested in stories like this, where we investigate different aspects of sports business, hit that subscribe button. I don't think you will regret it. I, I hope you won't regret it. You probably won't regret it. You, you're not gonna regret it. I'm dope. We are dope. We got a dope community here. Where we at now, we at almost 100 subscribers. We're almost at 100 subscribers. So help a brother out, almost there. Let's get to that triple digits, man. And I, I, I will be greatly, greatly, greatly appreciative. And for all y'all that have been here, again, I just want to say thank you. We, we, we almost hit 100 subscribers, which is insane. I started this channel almost a year ago. It was literally no expectations. So it's, it's pretty wild to me to say that we're almost at triple digits. So I just want to say thank you. I appreciate every single one of y'all. And I love each and every single one of y'all. Thank y'all so much. Let's keep growing this channel. Keep hitting that subscribe button. Keep hitting that thumbs up. And let's make some history, baby. Without further ado, let's get back to it. So to start, I think we should look at the current state of football on the global stage. I know in the setup to this video, I made it seem like the current state of the sport is that no one but Americans cared about American football. But that's actually not true. In fact, football does have a loyal following in many countries around the world. And I use the term loyal loosely. The NFL has a following in some parts of Europe, specifically UK and Germany, as well as Canada and Mexico. Canada and Mexico for obvious reasons, given the proximity to where the sport is played. UK and Germany though, those are for a bit different reasons. The UK and a few other European countries were initially introduced to football through a spring league the NFL started called the World League which was later renamed slash restructured to become NFL Europe. Teams were based out of Spain, Germany, the Netherlands, England, and Scotland. And the league lasted for almost two decades before the cost became unreasonable for NFL ownership, which resulted in them ending the league. The reason for that was the teams were made up of 90% American players, staff, coaches, one of whom was LeVar Ball, actually funny enough. We need him back in society. With so many American players, this meant that they need to be transported, housed, fed and entertained for roughly six months of the year in a completely different continent all on the NFL's dime. So the NFL felt the league just wasn't financially reasonable, especially when competing with sports like soccer and rugby, two of Europe's more established team games. NFL Europe was an attempt to expand the game of American football to international markets outside the United States, but was also a development league for the NFL. The league squads were predominantly assigned by NFL teams who wanted younger developmental players to get additional games experience and coaching. And attendance was solid at roughly 18,000 per game, which is close to the average attendance of an NBA game, but nowhere near the average rugby or Premier League game, the latter averaging over double the attendance of NFL Europe at the time. The league was also extremely unprofitable, with the NFL reportedly losing $30 million a season through this venture. But there were some key takeaways and benefits from this as well. NFL Europe was effective in developing interest in these countries. What the NFL probably realized was all that we were really doing was ex exporting the sport to these other regions. Most of the players, coaches, staff, and owners were all based in the US. So rather than build an entirely new league, why not just export your existing product to these markets? Which is exactly what they did. So the exact same year NFL Europe ended, the NFL kicked off the NFL International Series, which is a series of games during the regular season that played outside the United States. Since 2017, the series has two sub-series. That has used the word series probably like eight times already. The NFL London game games in London, which has been in place since 2007, and the NFL Mexico game in Mexico City, which began in 2016. These games have helped develop strong fan bases within these countries, arguably more effective than NFL Europe, and to be honest, it kind of makes sense. NFL Europe, while it was effective, was exporting players that quite literally had no chance at making the league. It transitioned from being a league where NFL teams could develop their players to more of a workaround for teams to gather exemptions for training camp.
take JT O'Sullivan, for example, who was named by some as the best player in NFL Europe, and he never made it higher than being the third string quarterback on the Chicago Bears. So if you're looking to export a sport into other countries, would you rather show them your best and brightest or players who couldn't even make a practice squad? Lamar Jackson or JT O'Sullivan? I'm not even trying to hate you. Yo, shouts out to my guy JT O'Sullivan. That's just such a fire name. Like, it just sounds like if I told you JT O'Sullivan was the greatest player of all time, wouldn't you believe me? That's just how fire that name is. JT O'Sullivan. The GOAT JT. Not Tom Brady. Tom Brady's just a. He's, I mean, amazing player all that but just just a whack name right it's like a two out of ten but jt o'sullivan that's so fire jt that's so fire you know what from now on we refer to the goat as jt o'sullivan on this channel by default 100 percent. if i ever say goat i'm referring to jt o'sullivan even if i'm not talking about football i'm talking about basketball soccer golf boxing jt o'sullivan goat by default now, the league's initial focus was on the UK and Mexico, as those were the only two countries where they played games outside of the US. That said, the league is now looking to expand across other markets, with Germany, of course, taking top priority. See, as much crap as I want to give the NFL Europe, it did do a fantastic job of creating foundational interest in these regions, as well as a familiarity with the sport. That said, by the end of its time, NFL Europe still had six teams, but now only spread across two countries, England, which had one team, and Germany, which had the other five. Germany, as it turns out, are huge American football fans. In fact, league data found more Germans travel to NFL London games than anywhere else in continental Europe. And here's an even crazier stat. The NFL is more widely watched in Germany than the NHL is in America. <laughs> as wow. So while European games were played exclusively in London through the 2010s, now with new management heading the league's international efforts, the NFL is actively exploring Germany as a second hub for European operations. Germany isn't the only place they're looking. The NFL is planning to divide up international markets across its 32 franchises, giving teams specific cities or regions in which they'll have some commercial exclusivity. The process, which is known inside the league as the International Home Marketing area initiative has been in the works for a few years and the goal is to develop a second home base for each team in the league which is a bit more strategic than just exporting the entire league into all these other countries and teams will submit commercial plans for different international markets they believe would they would be best suited for over the next five years and if granted the team would be provided exclusive rights such as marketing and a greater share of the gross revenue where in these markets teams will only need to share 20 percent of the revenue and keep 80 versus the 50 50 split which is standard here in the US. So let's take the Dallas Cowboys, for example, who, according to Cowboys CEO Stephen Jones, are eyeing nearby markets in Mexico, which makes sense. Texas, Mexico. Now, it's important to point out there's no expectation that the NFL would ever play games in any of these regions, but there's still other opportunity to grow. In the most recent iteration, it details six main areas of focus, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, UK, Germany, and China. There's no expectation games would actually be played there, but teams are still bidding to own those markets. Some of those regions will be broken up into smaller segments, such as Canada being divided regionally, such that one team, say the Seahawks, could receive rights to Vancouver given their proximity to one another. While maybe the Bills, who have a history of playing games in Toronto, could get the rights to that city or region. Canadian cities are the highest value markets given they're nearby, similar time zones, and that they'll likely also have accessibility to legal sports betting. Now of the other five regions not named Canada, Brazil has the most NFL fans at 64 million. Mexico comes in second at 48 and a half, followed by China at 42 million, and finally Germany at 19 million fans. Now that said, teams are encouraged to submit proposals for areas outside of those six countries. Market assignments are expected to be distributed in early 2022, and so there are a lot of bids just floating around. So we may see a few that are outside of the box. Nigeria is one that I would love to see, and it's one that I think could be severely overlooked, given its potential value. There's already a great connection to the league, given that there are quite a few Nigerian players playing in the NFL. In fact, in just the last draft, there were seven Nigerian players selected. What better way to make a connection with a region than to have players or people from there. And who knows, maybe the NFL will follow the blueprint like the NBA, not only market their game to these areas, but also develop grassroots efforts to find, nurture, and grow talent in these places. That's how football can truly become a global game. Not just by people watching it, but by people playing the sport and engaging with it. Who knows? And who's to say with enough investment and patience, football can't become a global game. Maybe we see the day that a player comes from China or Japan 
or the UK, or maybe even Africa. Or at the very least, maybe we start sharing cities. What if they become the Miami Lagos Dolphins or, or the Seattle Vancouver Seahawks or the New York Benghazi Giants? <laughs> <laughs> you never know, man. Maybe they'll pick up a couple of Libyan fans in the process. And at the very least, we can show y'all how to really celebrate a touchdown. All right, y'all. Thank y'all so much for making it through another video. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. We're doing everything we can to keep growing this channel. And any support we can get is greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. Appreciate y'all. For real. Thank you so much for all the love, all the support, and all the positivity. Have a great rest of your day. Love y'all. Peace. Yeah.